Sure. Thank you, uh, Piyush. Uh, and uh, first of all, thanks to uh, Professor Getu uh, for making this session possible. I think it's really a wonderful way to get uh, the word across to a large number of people. Uh, from our side, uh, we are very happy to actually be part of this and uh, engaging with uh, a large audience across the country and possibly across several countries in the world uh, to uh, really take this uh, forward and uh, be of assistance to those who are uh, really locked down during this period. Uh, so my talk is going to be a concrete for 3D printing. Uh, like Professor Getu said, uh, his talk and my talk were dealing more with uh, special concrete. So we're going to talk about special uh, applications for which these concretes are uh, used. Uh, I also wanted to inform that uh, most of the work that is being reported here is part of the larger group that we have, which is called uh, Imprint, which is IIT Madras uh, Printability Lab. And this is composed of researchers from IIT Madras as well as the company called Twasta. Now, Twasta is a company that manufactures uh, 3D printers for several applications. And those of you who are interested in uh, getting to know more about uh, how these are manufactured, what kind of 3D printers are available, you should be able to contact uh, Twasta, look up uh, Twasta and Google and get in touch with them directly. Okay. So here in my uh, talk, I'll primarily talk about how 3D printing can uh, help the industry and what kind of applications we can actually have with this material. So just to put this in perspective, 3D printing is one of the additive manufacturing techniques. So in conventional machine, uh, shops, you'll probably see that you've taken a large component of machine uh, of, of metal or plastic and use uh, several techniques like milling, turning, grinding, water jet cutting or sawing to cut the machine, uh, to cut the uh, element down to the kind of shape and size that you want. But as opposed to that, in additive manufacturing, what we want to do is deposit the material layer by layer so that it actually builds up into the component. The advantage is that we can reduce the amount of wastage that we have. So as far as uh, machining is concerned, uh, reduction of wastage is obviously a very important perspective. But what about construction? What does it help? Uh, how does it help construction? But before that, of course, let's look at the process that is involved. Uh, this is uh, now quite easily available. Actually, most of the software that are used for designing uh, 3D printing applications are now freely available on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of open source software. So if you're good with uh, software, you can actually do this process entirely on your own. Okay, But of course, from our side, from my side, I'm really not an expert in software. So I have left this uh, part of the operations to Twasta. So essentially, the first step is the creation of the model using a CAD software. So 3D model is created. And then uh, this 3D model is just taken and sliced into two dimensional slices. Now, this is akin to what you have with X-ray tomography, where you also take sliced images and then put them together to make a 3D model. Here is just the opposite. You have the 3D model, you break it down into slices, right? And once you break it down into slices, you give instructions to the computer to print those slices. So printing is the next step. So the file is transferred to the computer and the nozzle basically gets positioned uh, in the location that it's supposed to extrude the material and simply prints the material in that location. Now, after this, as far as concrete or even plastic or sometimes metal is concerned, you may have post-processing operations like curing, or sometimes you may want to create some sort of finish on the surface, okay? And then you get the final product. So this is the overall process of actually printing anything, whether it's concrete or metal or plastic, okay? Now, as far as construction is concerned, uh, the 3D printing is typically done using two types of systems. One is extrusion-based systems, and the other is binder jetting based systems. So extrusion based systems could be frame based. For example, you see in this picture, there's a frame on which you have this gantry that is moving and onto the gantry, there's a extended arm which connects the nozzle and the nozzle basically prints uh, by the X, Y and Z movements of this entire structure. The other possibility is actually to use a robotic arm. So this is the further stage of development when you have a single robot that can sit at one location and simply access all the locations where it has to print rather than the gantry moving to all the different locations. Okay? So that's extrusion is one of the techniques of 3D printing. The other is called binder jetting. So where we actually spray binder onto the surface of, uh, 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 spray the activator onto the surface of the binder. I'll just show you that we feel it. So how is additive manufacturing useful in Sorry. Sorry, uh, yeah, I think I lost my voice connection there. Yeah, so additive manufacturing is a useful technique in construction because it essentially leads to a reduction in construction time and labor cost. 
uh, form work free, uh, the, the technology is form work free, and we know that form work actually takes away a lot of the time and cost as far as uh, uh, construction is concerned. Nearly 30 to 40 percent of the concrete construction costs is attributed to form work, and more importantly, nearly 60 percent of the time is wasted in assembling and disassembling form work. So, if you can print concrete and forego the use of form work, you can actually lead to a large saving in your construction time. And uh, the fact that you can actually print very complicated structures makes it very good for architectural elements. So it gives you that flexibility to try and print something very different compared to conventional um, uh, casting of construct uh, concrete. So there are several examples from around the world of extrusion-based 3D printing. I've shown you some in this picture here uh, from different countries, Netherlands, Italy, USA, uh, and, uh, and Slovenia, and so on and so forth. And many of these systems are gantry-based systems, uh, either uh, rectangular or uh, uh, the ones which work in Cartesian coordinates or the ones which work in uh, the spherical coordinates. So there are several different types of systems that cylindrical, sorry, not spherical, cylindrical coordinates. So there are several different systems which are used. The one on the top right here is actually the robotic arm printer, which is a little a bit more sophisticated than your typical gantry printers. Right. So. This is an example of the construction of 3D printed building in Shanghai. You can see that uh, on the top left, you have the image of the gantry printer. Uh, the nozzle is printing this, these elements. These elements after printing and after they are hardened enough are uh, stacked in the yard. And then they are transported to the site where they are assembled, just like what you do with modular masonry construction. So this is one of the options available. If you don't want to carry your printer to the site, you can do a centralized printing in the factory and simply carry the printed elements to the site and assemble it. And of course, using several of these techniques, there's a lot of examples of 3D printing of houses that has been done across the world. Uh, one of the primary uh, contributors to this is Vincent Global, which is a Chinese company, which has printed components for 10 houses in a single day, or at least they claim that. We don't clearly know what uh, exactly it is that they've done, but at least they claim that they printed uh, components for 10 houses in a single day. And these examples that you're seeing on the right here are uh, from Vincent Global. Uh, this one example on the left is from Apiscore, which is a 3D printed house in Moscow. Uh, you may see several links in uh, Google saying that this is uh, something that was printed uh, in, a, in a matter of a few tens of hours. But in reality, the printing time was that much. The total time of, of uh, actually bringing up the structure was a lot more than that. Anyway, so nevertheless, uh, what I wanted to actually add is house construction could be uh, one of the possible applications of 3D printing. Uh, again, some more examples here of uh, interesting structures. This on the left is actually the first inhabited house that has been constructed with 3D printing. And on the right is a more uh, fancy looking concrete castle that was done by Rudenko, one of the top uh, guys as far as 3D printing is concerned. Uh, 3D printing is also used obviously for a lot of architectural elements. Uh, like you see here, it's almost looking like a tree on top. And this is a bus shelter. Uh, of course, you, I don't know why you would have to go through, uh, through all the pains to actually make a structure like that, but nevertheless, it has been used to print some bus, uh, bus shelters by Vincent. Uh, this is very interesting. You can actually print very interesting looking, very beautiful looking street furniture using 3D printed concrete. Uh, some more examples. Uh, the top left example is that by uh, the U US Army Corps of Engineers, which actually thought of uh, using 3D printing as an option to actually construct barracks for army people in difficult locations where normal construction could not be used. And that's something which is quite interesting because we can think about sending printer and material to difficult terrains uh, to actually do the construction with minimal uh, uh, involvement of actual laborers. What you see on the uh, top right is an example from the CM Cement Company in Thailand. And they have given a very nice interwoven sort of texture to the concrete, which looks almost like a, 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 a something made with straw. Uh, the bottom image is from ETH Zurich, where they've attempted to create uh, some freeform type structures, columns, uh, and you can see the kind of uh, intricacy involved in actually doing these kinds of prints. Uh, 3D printing has also been used uh, for bridges. Uh, this is the pedestrian bridge in Madrid. It was the first 3D printed pedestrian bridge in Madrid. And this uh, actually is a post-tensioned uh, 3D printed bridge in Netherlands. It's very interesting because here uh, there was also a steel wire spool that was used as a reinforcement for the 3D printed uh, concrete. Right, so what are the challenges? We know that all these structures have been demonstrated across the world. What are the real challenges that we need to face as material scientists to really uh, acknowledge or to really overcome uh, the problems associated with uh, designing such materials? One is 
In terms of the mixture design itself, uh, how do we get robust and stable mixtures that we can use time and again to print the same quality of the structure? Uh, how do you actually print with coarse aggregate? If you look at the examples across the world, all of them, except one, which is from the US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, used only sand as the aggregate. So coarse aggregate was not at all utilized in most of the projects across the world, because it's very difficult, as you can imagine, to extrude material with coarse aggregate. It's much easier to do it with paste or mortar. Now, the other option, uh, other aspect, which is very challenging is how do we actually reinforce printed concrete structures? There is no way of actually printing the steel also. It's not easy because steel is a metal and you can't really print steel uh, because steel has a much larger range of temperatures over which it has the fluid to solid transition. Whereas concrete is fluid in the fresh state and hardens up in the uh, hardened state. So the concrete properties can be controlled, but steel is not easy to print along with the concrete. So how do we reinforce these structures? And as far as modeling is concerned, how do we develop the right kind of viscoelastic models so that we can predict how these layers will be formed? Please remember that we'll actually be laying concrete layer by layer. And when you lay the layers on top, the layers on bottom are getting deformed. So essentially, what is contributing to the internal buildup of the structure because of the hydration characteristics of the concrete or because of thixotropic properties? So all this leads to a large area of research, primarily in rheology of the concrete itself. So one major rheological aspect that is very important is yield stress. Now yield stress, we uh, conventionally denote when regular concrete with the slump of the concrete. So for a concrete which has a very low yield stress, you see that it almost slumps down completely or starts flowing just like self-compacting concrete. On the other hand, when you do concrete for paving applications, it's got zero slump. So it's got a very high internal stress that needs to be overcome before you make it flow. So, once you extrude the material out of the nozzle, it needs to have sufficiently good fluidity or flowability to come out of the nozzle. But once it starts depositing, so for example, once it is depositing layer by layer, it has to have sufficiently good internal structural buildup so that when you start laying the top layers, the bottom layers do not start collapsing under the self weight of the top layers. Okay? So again, here we are dealing with a rheological parameter called yield stress. So we need high yield stress for buildability. That means depositing layer by layer on the other hand, we need low viscosity that allows the material to extrude out of the nozzle. So again, challenging design because usually making yield stress go with viscosity or high yield stress go with low viscosity is not an easy concept. So you really need to do a lot of experimentation to get your rheology right. Okay. So moving on, the other aspect that uh, helps in actually the buildability as to how fast you can build layer by layer of these systems is the internal structural buildup of the concrete. In concrete, there's an interesting uh, internal property called thixotropy, which means that the concrete structure evolves when it is not subjected to any external shear. So if you leave concrete at rest, it tends to build, build up its own internal structure. Now that contributes to the resistance that the concrete layers have to deformation caused by the layers of the additional uh, or weight of the additional layers that are added on top. For example, if you plot the yield stress with respect to time, it undergoes a increase like this. So essentially what's happening is you want the yield stress of the concrete to be high enough that when the second layer comes on, the self weight due to the second layer is not larger than the yield stress. Similarly, as you go on with time, when you deposit the third layer, the overall weight of the second and third layers should be less than the yield stress exhibited by the bottom layer so that the layer does not deform. But we need to study these characteristics. We need to come up with estimates of how the yield stress actually changes with respect to time. So this is called structural buildup, and it's got a lot of important uh, uh, aspects related to how we can actually design concrete for 3D printing. So what we did in IIT Madras is uh, we wanted to come up with a mixed design procedure that could be applied uh, for different printing systems. So first, we worked with a very simple test bed printer to, uh, to develop a systematic mixture design method, and then we try to look at how we can apply different test methods to assess the extrudability, buildability, robustness, and workability retention. We also looked at some additives, how it can influence the characteristics of the uh, 3D printed concrete. And with second uh, level, we, we wanted to scale it up to a larger scale printer, which could actually help us in printing elements that could be assembled to make a full scale structure. So this is uh, an example of the smallest printer that we actually have. Uh, it's like almost like a tabletop printer. It's got a very small nozzle, uh, which can print 30 by 20 millimeter rectangular segments. And you can see here the printing is in progress for a square element and also for some wall elements on the right side here. Okay, 
So this is a simple printer. Uh, it works with a, a, a screw-based pump, so which is simply uh, pushing the material into the pipe here, and the material finally comes out of the nozzle. So there's not much pressure on the material. So you need to design the material to be fairly fluid, but at the same time, when the material comes out, it should attain significant uh, yield stress so that it's able to uh, tolerate the weight of the layers that are, are building up on top. So here you can see that these walls, uh, the, the wall that has been built up with different layers, uh, each layer almost has the same thickness. That means the material quality has been good. It's exhibiting good buildability. So here again, we did buildability tests looking at how deposition uh, uh, of new layers was changing the dimensions of the lower layers and extrudability was just looked at by how well printed the layer was in terms of its shape and size. And these are all well published or uh, uh, available in lit literature to actually follow up on. Now, what we also do did was uh, we estimated the yield stress using a simple technique. This is the soil vein shear apparatus, which includes an outer cylinder and inner vein. So you fill up the mortar, which is freshly mixed into the cylinder, and then you uh, uh, make the vein rotate at a constant uh, rate. And then we look at the maximum shear that comes in when the vein rotates, and that is basically the yield stress. So what we wanted to define was how does this yield stress start varying when we make small changes in the superclusters and dosage. So in other words, does our mix remain robust to be able to get extruded and printed even if we change the superclusters and dosage a little bit up and down. So here, this is the mix that we actually used to originally print the concrete. This is uh, something that we worked out on trial and error basis depending on the material mixes that were actually available in literature. We did our own trials and tried to figure out what would be the optimum uh, type of uh, binder, binder uh, con components and how much binder and how much aggregate. So here, binder to aggregate ratio here was 40 to 60. So you know that this is a mix that is very rich in cement and cementitious material. So it's not really something that can be actually uh, look, looked at uh, in conventional sense, right? Because in conventional concrete, you have much more binder, uh, much more aggregate than binder. So you see here that uh, fibers were also used, polypropylene fibers were used at normal dosage, only 1.8 kilogram per cubic meter to prevent plastic shrinkage cracking. The aggregate was consisting only of sand of maximum size, two millimeters. And we also had a filler in terms of quartz powder at 60 micron size. So you see here, uh, the reference mixture had a 1.6 kilopascal yield stress, but as soon as you change the, uh, the superclasses of dosage above and below, there was a major deviation from the yield stress. While the deviation was not large for an increase in superplus as a dosage, all these could not really pass the buildability test. That means the bottom layer basically collapsed when the second layer was cast on top of the first layer. On the other hand, when you reduce the SP dosage, the uh, extrudability itself started failing. So here, there was a lack of robustness in the, um, uh, the reference mix. So what we tried was we wanted to use uh, other additives to improve this robustness. And this we achieved by the use of nanoclick. Uh, at up to 0.3% of the binder content and we saw that there was significant improvement in the robustness. Although you see that uh, it looks like a large variation, but the scale here is quite different from what you had in the other, uh, other system, right? So variability factor decreased from 4.5 to 0.7 kilopascal with 0.3% nanoclear addition. That means there's significant advance, uh, improvement in the characteristic. Similarly, we used a conventional viscosity modifying agent. Here we used hydroxypropyl methane cellulose, which is a common VMA that is used in, uh, in, in your uh, uh, mortars that are used for plastering and for uh, binding. So uh, VMA really helped in improving the robustness and silica film also helped in improving the robustness of the system significantly. Now, we also looked at the structural buildup with time, measuring the yield stress uh, using the vein shear test with passage of time. And we were able to see that we could actually model the development of the yield stress quite well with, uh, with an available rheological model proposed by Perot in 2015. And this uh, seemed to match up quite well with the experimental data that we have. So there are existing rheological models that can be applied to study the rheology of 3D printed concrete as to how the development actually happens. Now, the difficult part is actually doing the mechanical characterization because you're not really casting the concrete, you're printing the concrete. So how does this printing make a difference? So we tried various different approaches. We tried uh, wallet of four layers here in compression to try and determine compressive strength. We had a two layer system here, which was subjected to bending and we did a flexional uh, response test to determine the models of rupture. But what we saw was there was a lot of difference between the printed specimens and the 
as molded specimens. So that's obviously because of the interfaces that are coming because of printing. We wanted to look at the interfacial strength. So we designed a rig to do a bond test or rather how these interfaces are bonded well together. Okay. And we saw that in general, the layered specimen showed about 10 to 15% lower strength. We changed this uh, approach a little bit and went for a larger uh, detailed characterization by printing these uh, sort of vault specimens. You see that there are six vertical, uh, six layers printed vertically and two layers printed horizontally. And we looked at this uh, uh, strength development uh, in terms of cubicle specimens and uh, in terms of bending specimens uh, taken through this vault in several different directions. Okay, so, but I'm not, I'm not going to go to the details here because of the lack of time, but in general, what is seen is wherever the interfaces are playing a large role, you see a de decremented strength. But wherever you see that the strength is higher than the mold cast concrete, the strength is higher because the failure plane is going right through the printed location. So whenever the failure is through the printed locations, you see an increase in the strength. That means that the material that comes out of the nozzle, which is extruded, seems to have a higher packing, better packing, as opposed to the material that is simply molded. So that's, uh, you can get more details uh, in this paper. I'll, I'll list this paper later at the end of the presentation also. Now, what happens when you try to scale up this printing to a larger printer? Now, I talked about a screw-based pump and you need to design the material in a fairly fluid state to really print through a screw-based pump. But what about larger printing systems where you're trying to pump the concrete? So here, this is a piston-based pump. Here, we are trying to pump this concrete through the pipe here and to the nozzle, which is able to print this larger uh, sort of a segment. Now here the problem is, if your pumping pressures are very high, it will start creating uh, your fluid phase to get separated from the solid phase. And that's something which is quite difficult for uh, sustaining this material, because if it starts losing out its uh, uh, cohesive characteristic, you'll not really get the kind of print that you want. So you need to put in an additional layer of testing to look at uh, how uh, this material can be actually printed in spite of the printing pressures. So you see here the printing is in progress with this printer. This is the second largest scale printer and it can be used to print uh, 75 by 75 centimeters and up to a height of about half a meter. Right, so with this uh, uh, printer, we actually built up uh, this uh, structure, which is the first modular printed uh, structure in India. Uh, and here again, the mix design was quite similar to what I had shown you previously. Uh, but what we did was we printed modules of uh, 20 layers of 50 millimeters each. So that was about 30 centimeters for each module. And then we stacked them up with uh, joining mortar in between. Okay. And finally, we did a uh, post uh, uh, installation of reinforcement at the four corners, right? You, you see in the previous picture that there, the corners have some cavities where we can actually install reinforcement at a later age. So that's what we did after we assembled all the components together. We installed the reinforcement at the four corners and then grouted the reinforcement again. But what we are doing currently is looking at how the compressive strength and elastic modulus will evolve with time and uh, how we can use that to develop prediction models for compression and buckling failure. Because you can imagine when you're printing these slender elements, there'll be, if you start printing out of plane, there's a chance that these layers will tend to collapse. Or if the internal yield stress or buildup of the yield stress is not good enough in the lower layers, there could also be compression failures that can happen when you start printing more and more layers. And all that is going to affect the speed of printing. One way to increase the speed of the printing is to also use accelerators, and uh, that will help you print more layers in any given application. So again, use of accelerators is something that we are also looking at uh, seriously. And how do we actually predict the buildup using non-destructive techniques? Yield stress is okay for a laboratory exercise, but in the, in the site, when you're actually doing the printing, how do we understand that the material is able, to, uh, capable of taking many more layers on top? And again, the other aspect is how can we actually help the printing process understand whether the printed layer has the right geometrical tolerance or not? So we are trying to see whether we can use lasers to see the uh, perfect uh, geometry has been achieved in the wall printing or not, and feeding that back into the printing loop to see whether the next printing loop can actually be adjusted to improve the geometrical uh, design. Okay, so. Uh, I know that uh, this was quite fast. There's a lot more uh, uh, detail. I want you to refer to these papers if you're really interested in 3D printing. This is the publications that we have uh, from our group on 3D printing. Much of the work is done by my PhD student, Rahul, who is now currently at Ghent University on another very interesting and uh, exciting project of 3D printing. So again, uh, you're, you're free. Uh, please feel free to interact with me by email also if you need more detail. Uh, but these papers 
members are definitely available to give you more of the details of what we actually went through in this design process. Okay, so in conclusion, 3D printing is a promising technology for the future. And what we have shown at IITM is using a systematic procedure for mixed design can help overcome the challenges when we try to scale up this printing application from the small printer to the large printer. And in fact, what I've not shown you is the third stage of printing where we have actually been able to print 1.5 meter tall elements all at once. I mean, I'm saying all at once implying that we don't need to really print smaller elements and then join them in a modular fashion. We can actually print up to 1.5 meters now with the new printer that is available from Costa. Okay. And so we also, uh, I also showed you how we actually printed our first 3D printed structure using the modular construction that we did. So thank you all for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks, uh, Professor Manu, uh, for an excellent talk. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of questions, but in the interest of time, we can take a few. I think there are a few questions where they want to know the difference between 3D printing and uh, you know conventional prefabrication. So can you just uh, highlight okay. the difference? And also, can we combine these two? Okay, so uh, of course, I showed you an example where 3D printed elements were fabricated in a centralized plant. Now, the difference there with the prefabricated technology is that for prefabricating with concrete, you still need form work to do the uh, fabrication of different shapes. With 3D printing, you don't need any form work because you're printing the shape directly. So that's essentially the difference. But otherwise, of course, uh, if you're printing it in a centralized factory, then it's a prefabricated 3D printed structural element, which needs to be brought to site in order to get assembled. Okay. Uh, another question is on the accuracy of size and durability of these 3D printed uh, elements. Sorry, accuracy of? Of uh, maybe element size, you know, uh, how do we maintain uh, the accuracy? Yeah, so that, that's a big challenge because uh, as I said earlier, that when you keep on printing layer upon layer, there's a chance that the lower layers start deforming. So uh, when you don't design your mix well enough, the deformation in the lower layers can be significantly large and that can cause your uh, overall uh, 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 tolerance of the dimension to completely get altered. And that's something that you need to build into your system to ensure that first you're printing well. And second, if you are going off by a few uh, uh, tenths of a millimeter in one direction or the other, there should be some way to actually correct this in line. So there are processes that are being developed in that uh, uh, okay. aspect. Yeah. yeah, what about durability part? Uh, durability is something that we have not extensively studied. As far as the material itself is concerned, it is going to be quite durable because we are designing it with uh, concrete or water cement ratio of less than 0 0.35 mostly. Uh, the only difficulty is that we cannot predict this durability when you have the layered systems. So when you have the layered systems, the penetration could as well happen through the layers, especially when you have uh, uh, nozzles that are, uh, that are printing cylindrical components. There could be gaps between layers through which you can actually have water flowing through. Uh, in all the cases that we've printed with square components uh, or rectangular uh, printing filaments, we have not seen any major uh, impact of, uh, of printing on durability. We have the structure that I showed you, the modular structure. Uh, it's been standing in the open for nearly, uh, now it's about one and a half years. And uh, it, whenever we had massive rains also, there was no water penetration into the structure. Okay. Another question is on uh, whether we can use fiber reinforced concrete in 3D printing. Yeah, so all the concrete that I showed you uh, has been fiber reinforced. We've been using polypropylene fibers because they are easy to extrude through the nozzle. And we are using a small dosage just to ensure that we don't get any shrinkage cracking in the concrete. Uh, now, printing with steel fibers has been attempted, but it's going to be a very difficult exercise because steel fibers can give a large uh, a degree of harshness to your mixes, which may be difficult to extrude out of the nozzle, but you need to do a proper design and arrive at the right dosage which can be printed. Yes, fiber reinforced concrete definitely is needed as far as 3D printing is concerned. Okay. Another question uh, is uh, from the choice in India, you know, of how house owner is really like highly varied and uh, demands uh, more tailor-made solutions. So how to deal this as, uh, with this aspect in 3D printing? Otherwise, it will be only limited to mass or infrastructure elements. Yeah, so uh, currently, of course, the biggest possible potential is actually for application in housing because uh, as you rightly said uh, everybody wants to customize uh, the development of their house and if, if you can think of uh, let's say 100 houses coming up in a neighborhood and everybody wants their own specific design it's not easy to do a brief application because you need different molds for different uh, houses and that's an ideal 
arrangement where you can actually practice 3D printing because you don't need form work anymore. You can now print uh, complicated elements and uh, uh, attune it to the design that is sought by the customer. So customer centric designs can be sought, but currently, of course, uh, printing remains in the realm of uh, uh, very expensive technologies because right now, uh, the large scaling of printing applications is still far away, uh, where it can be integ integrated into conventional construction. Okay. Thanks so much for answering uh, all the questions. And as uh, usual, uh, please, uh, you can email to Professor Manu. If you have more questions, he'll be happy to answer uh, questions you have. Thanks so much. Now we'll hand it over to Professor Getu. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers. What I want to do is see if all the speakers can turn on their uh, uh, videos. Let's see if we can do a group photo of this historic, historic uh, occasion. Prashant, okay. Uh, is any uh, Radha Krishna? Okay, let me see how to do this. Uh, 